Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Anthony Gardner. I'm the manager of uh, the Accessibility Hub at La Trobe University in Melbourne. And I'm delighted uh, today to have three very special panel members to uh, speak with us. And uh, I'm going to introduce, first of all, Professor Sarah O'Shea, who's the director of the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education at Curtin University in Perth, Australia. And Associate Professor Tim Pittman, he's the Senior Research and Equity Fellow at the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education, also from Curtin University. And we have Mr James Chan as a student in psychology at the Singapore University of Social Sciences and is also uh, the Inclusion Advisor at the Asia Europe Foundation in Singapore. So I'd like to thank you all for attending today and um, welcome all of our participants in breakout room three. Um, this session will be a, a really a question and answer session. I have a series of questions for our panel members and we will also, uh, if there is time, because uh, we've run a little short now, but we'll also try to take some questions from the audience at the end of our presentation. So feel free to put those in chat if you have a question to raise. Um, I'll hand over first of all to um, Professor O'Shea. And my, my beginning question is, um, Professor O'Shea, what do we mean by students with special needs? Who is it that we're actually talking about? Oh, well, thanks, Anthony. This was a really interesting question. Um, and um, yeah, I had to give some thought to this because I suppose personally, I, I prefer to talk about students with additional needs. So um, for me, the term special, while it's really a positive term, it does infer um, a, a level of difference, you know, um, whereas students with additional needs, um, it's more about really recognizing that um, students can be the, the, the same, but they, that they often have extra, extra things that they need help with that we may not be um, aware of. So um, I think that's really important because it's often assumed that if you, if you have a disability, then you, you're sort of special, you have a special need. Um, and that you're in some way different in terms of appearance or behavior or ability, but that's often not the case, as we know. You know, instead, many people can require additional support at different stages of their university career. Um, perhaps, you know, a mental health issue might develop, um, an accident might occur, or a physical ailment, ailment might students more broadly and um, and that, that's research that the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education I have sort of given um, given a bit of a plug here for the National Centre um, and just to showcase some of the research we've done in this area so um, there are many ways that that students may consider these additional needs and so a one-fits-all model I think is key as well that we don't assume that um, we, can, we can have one level of support that can be applied to all, all students with, with um, additional needs. Um, for example, students may not wish to be defined by their needs and instead prefer to perhaps let the institu institution know that some additional support might be needed, but it's not a necessity. Others might require ongoing and coordinated support. So um, I think importantly that it's really uh, key that any support that we offer uh, students always starts with the students themselves, with the individual learner. So this might involve more resources in terms of staffing, but um, I think it's really crucial to build that support to suit the students rather than impose sort of institutional models or institutional definitions of what that special need or additional need might be. Thanks, for prof Professor O'Shea. I was just taking a note there. Um, so there is uh, important consideration of what is a special need and what is, is just a different need or an additional need. Yeah, and that's an important point to consider. Um, can you talk about uh, for us now how COVID has impact on the inclusion of students with additional needs uh, in higher education uh, this, this year? And what have we seen? 
Yeah. And um, look, I think all students have been really badly hit by COVID. Um, and, uh, but it, with the students with these additional needs, often those impacts have been exacerbated. Uh, so many of these learners may be medically vulnerable, so for example, so exposure to the bug may have really uh, huge implications. Also, the isolating nature of COVID may particularly hit those uh, with, with additional needs, particularly if, if mobility is already impaired or if they rely on additional carers. So we have seen in Australia that um, you know, often uh, people that require additional care were particularly badly hit by COVID-19 because people were reluctant to go into homes and, uh, and care in case there was infection there. Also, for those who are hearing impaired, uh, wearing a mask and trying to understand what people are saying with the mask can be really difficult and very isolating as well. But, you know, COVID's also offered some possibilities. And I think the previous speaker, one of the keynotes, in fact, I think uh, a number of the keynotes pointed to some of those um, opportunities as well. Um, so what seemed like an impossibility just a short period of time ago, I mean, at the beginning of the year, I think if I'd said to anyone in the audience, within months, we're all going to be delivering education online. I don't think anyone would have really believed that um, because there's always road stops and roadblocks within institutions. Uh, technical systems don't speak to each other. Um, and, and there's always been reasons why we can't move to, to an online environment. Um, but we, we have, and there's also additional supports now that are available. So for example, uh, on-screen captioning um, for hearing impaired people, the availability of transcripts almost immediately for those who have um, uh, hearing issues or uh, sight issues. Uh, or, or larger font sizes as well. So in a way, COVID has, uh, has uh, offered us a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. Um, I think personally, it's quite important that we don't, uh, and I think the previous speaker said this as well, that we don't return to the old ways of doing things, that we do uh, embrace what is the good of what has come out of COVID, but also recognizing that the human touch is always key as well and that we shouldn't really go totally online because many individual students really appreciate that one-on-one -on -one, um, human contact. Thanks, Professor O'Shea. Um, I think you raised some important points there around the sense of isolation that uh, has impacted uh, students who uh, have been exposed to COVID or whose family members have been exposed to COVID. We certainly heard a lot about uh, the challenges that those students have faced uh, and um, the reluctance of others to engage with those students out of a, out of a certain fear of, of contamination. Um, and, and particularly, and I think Tim will talk more about this um, shortly, is about the the benefits of online education has afforded to some students at the same time as it has disadvantaged others. So I look forward to hearing more about that. We have one question uh, that's come through on the chat in relation to a university or a higher education institution's responsibility to support students with disability. Is that, uh, I guess the question is really, is that a universal right? for that institutions should be providing support um, through a department, I guess, set up for students. Is that something that we should expect all universities to be putting in place, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, it is a, it, within Australia, it is a legal right. Um, and I think that's important that there is a, um, you know, a legal right for, for education and that you know, we know that a lot of these supports um, and the resourcing needed for them are quite high. Uh, so institutions uh, may balk at the cost. So I, I think it's important that there is some sort of um, universal application of support and that there is some oversight of that to ensure that um, that is being done across the sector. 
uh, rather than just certain institutions doing it. It, it. You know, education is a key fundamental right. Thanks, Professor Ashley. And that's certainly backed up by the uh, United Nations statement on the rights of people with disabilities. Um, so, and, and I suspect James, you might have something to say about that uh, uh, as we get to you in a subsequent question, but that's a really important thing. And, and to those who have raised that question, thank you for that question. It is an important one. Uh, and it is, we think, a, a moral and a, and a social obligation of every institution to provide adjustments and support for students with disability. Absolutely. Um, I will now pass on to question number three, which is uh, for Associate Professor Tim Pittman. Um, Tim, what do you think are some of the challenges for students with special needs uh, uh, in access to higher education? Uh, so those students who need additional supports or services. And have we gone backwards or forwards in 2020? Thanks, Anthony. Um, first, the challenges the students face uh, commence even before they get to higher education. Uh, many countries, including Australia, uh, access is competitive. There are, there are more students wanting to go to university than there are places. And so we have to compete for places. And students, many students with disabilities have not had the same opportunities in primary and secondary education and they are less academically prepared, not because they don't have the ability, but because they've been less supported. Yeah. This means that they don't necessarily get the grades to get into the course they want or even into university at all. So the challenges start there. Um, if they do get into university, then uh, universities, uh, as, as Professor O'Shea said, in most countries are signatories to the United Nations Convention on um, People with Disabilities, and they do do their utmost to support the students but it means that everything that, the, that all students are trying to do, students with disabilities are often trying to do the same thing and struggling with particular issues. And those issues are not only how the education is being delivered to them, but also the issues they face in their day-to-day -day life. And that leads to the second part of your question, have we gone backwards in 2020? It's a bit of a mixed bag. Again, as Sarah was saying, the, the reality is overall, yes, we have gone backwards. Uh, as part of the research I'm doing now, I was uniquely placed. I, I've, I'm working with a group of almost 2,000 students with disability, and I got to ask them the specific question, has the support, has your educational quality experience gone backwards or forwards as a result of the coronavirus? And across those students, it was quite clear that support levels had degraded, had gotten worse. But within that, um, Again, as, as the earlier speaker and Sarah said, it's quite clear that there is an opportunity that when universities had to mobilise and move all their students online, they suddenly found possibilities and opportunities that they always knew were there, but there was never the will or the reason to uh, explore them. And now suddenly they had to. So the experience for many students with disability has been that they can see the potential that this year has opened up real opportunities, but they're still not being delivered necessarily in a high quality way. There are lots of gaps, there are lots of problems. And for many students, they don't like the fact that it's an either or. For example, before 2020, some students would have preferred to study online because it was easy to manage their medical or physical condition. It was easier for them to, um, to work within fatigue and pain levels and study when they were. But for other students, they did like studying on campus for that social interaction, you know, for that human contact. They also find things like following what the, le the lecturers say easier in, in, in person. They find the class interactions better. Now that's been flipped. You've now got those students all studying online and for some that's great and they thought that's fantastic but for others they're lacking. And what the students are saying is we need both. We need universal design for learning principles which means that regardless of coronavirus, regardless of international borders being open or closed, regardless of universities being open or closed, we have the opportunity depending on our particular circumstances um, to study either on campus or online or a mixture of both.
Thanks, Professor Professor Pittman. And, and, and you raise a really interesting point there about universal design and its implementation. Uh, it's something that gets a lot of um, press, certainly here in Australia, and a lot of contention. What do you think are those principles? What are we talking about when we speak of universal design? Universal design for learning principles extend, extend across the entirety of the, the learning of the teaching and learning experience. For many people, when they think of universal design, because it's because the principles are, have a strong foundation in architectural practice, they think about the built environment. They think about just ramps being everywhere or uh, rooms, plenty of rooms having good sound levels. And that's obviously part of universal design. The second part that people tend to think about universal design is around technology. The technology opens up opportunities for different ways of teaching. Again, online versus on campus is a classic example. But that's, again, only one aspect. Universal design and what the students with disability have been talking to as part of my project also fundamentally gets to how you deliver the education. So again, um, earlier Professor Sarah Shade talked about captions on, on, uh, on lectures. So the lectures are pre-recorded. Now in some universities, as a matter of course, they caption all their recorded lectures. And that's an example of universal design. The student doesn't have to ask for it. It's there across all courses. And many students, not just those with disabilities, benefit from that. Uh, students whose uh, English is a second language in Australia can also benefit, for example. However, in other universities, the student has to ask for those um, lectures to be captioned. Now, universities will do that. They are legally required to in Australia. But that's not a universal design approach because the students have to go and ask. And that leads to a really important aspect of universal design that people maybe overlook with students with disability. And that is the more you adopt principles of universal design, the less likely or the less times a student has to disclose their disability in order to get a quality learning experience. So returning to that example, if a university, as a matter of course, just captions all of their lectures, records all of their lectures and makes them available to all students, a student does not need to identify as having a disability in order to arrange the captioning. It's there already. This can reduce their levels of anxiety and can also reduce the chances of them being discriminated against. So accessibility of web design, but also uh, awareness training for teachers and lecturers about the needs um, and the expectations of students with disabilities. All these feed into a principle of universal design, which means that you won't 100% be able to stop having to have certain students disclose and come and ask for particular support and particular services. But the more you adopt universal design, the more the students can just feel that they are just one of every other student and they're not being treated any differently. Thanks, Associate Professor Tim Pittman. That, that's a really, really important point, isn't it? That we, uh, we require, certainly in Australia, we, we, we require students to disclose that they have a disability in order to receive adjustments. And uh, I'll, I'll pass to uh, Mr. Chan shortly because I think where that becomes really interesting in Asia is the reluctance to declare uh, the presence of disability, um, the, the, the sense of shame or, or <clears throat> stigma associated, associated with that. A universal design of all curriculum is actually one way of overcoming that need to declare. Uh, and, and that could be a really, really important strategy for, for colleagues uh, who are here today to, to think about. Um, I'd like to pass over to Mr. Chan for our next question, which is, um, Mr. Chan, what are some of the specific challenges you've identified or experienced in your journey into higher education? And what helped you to be a successful student? Well, I think um, uh, to start off, we need to, I would like to analyze um, the issues I faced before I entered higher education and um, during my higher education. So um, I'm actually a late diagnosed um, um, person with disability. Um, I was only diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder 
um, three years ago, uh, which meant that uh, for a, a good entirety of my, um, a good uh, portion of my life, I have not accessed the right social um, environments. I have not accessed the right um, knowledge and um, help about how to understand more about my unique um, abilities and my unique behaviors. And um, so um, I got bullied a lot in, 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 in school. Um, I, I faced a lot of stress because of this. Um, uh, I found it difficult to get support in, in school itself because um, um, of how I was misunderstood uh, based on my behaviors. And um, the, the schools I was in uh, were not active um, um, in connecting me with the right resources and people. And so um, in terms of the academic grades that um, I, I attained because of the stress um, uh, going through the curriculum, I, it took me about um, six, uh, eight years after I finished my diploma level at, in, in Singapore, which is the same as the TAFE um, qualification in Australia. Um, it took me eight years to access um, a, a bachelor's level um, education. So it took me a while to really get through that glass ceiling in my um, context. But um, after I got into the, um, into the university level, um, I, I then faced um, a lot of the stigma and the difficulties to um, access um, uh, um, accessible uh, education uh, at the level uh, because of a lot of things that uh, we've mentioned. And of course, we're going to talk about stigma later as well. Um, in uh, more of a conservative um, culture, um, especially in, my, in the local context, um, in my opinion, um, because of a lot of misunderstanding and a lack of understanding on what it means to live as a disabled person or, or, or what disability is, um, uh, we face a lot of rejection uh, uh, from people's subtle um, uh, social problems um, when identifying with a, pers with, as a disabled person or a person with additional needs. And so um, um, students with disabilities uh, generally do not like talking about these things. But in conservative societies, um, uh, policies and um, and resources and opportunities for um, access are given uh, from a top-down approach. Um, universities and governments um, uh, enact policies and um, infrastructures for access, and then they are trickled down to um, the users. Um, but that requires a more emphasis on access to information that the people actually know that these things exist and um, of course, as I mentioned, due to stigma, um, people are not as willing to identify themselves with disability, as such as um, their needs remain more invisible, and they end up not seeking that level of support. And um, I think that it's an issue which I um, uh, personally have faced um, uh, before my university education and even uh, during now. Thanks, Mr. Chan. And can you talk about some of the things that have really helped you in, in your journey now? I think that the, the main thing that I've really uh, benefited from um, uh, is uh, working alongside um, other individuals in the same educational space to advocate for greater inclusion and accessibility in education. Um, I personally believe in the bottom up approach um, to policy um, um, influence. Um, we talk a lot about um, giving agency to the student body, um, about giving them a voice and the capacity for change um, uh, in collaboration with the staff of universities and with uh, policymakers in the government. I think that we should do the same for uh, um, the disabled community uh, in and outside of academia. Um, um, I personally have um, 
um, made friends and connections with um, people in this uh, sector, uh, inside and outside of Singapore. Of Singapore. Uh, we, get, we share a lot of experiences on, on our own um, cultures and uh, practices on how we can um, take control of our learning environment and to use resources available to the best of our abilities and capacities and also how we can um, better uh, work with our um, staff partners um, in the universities and with also other policymakers in, the, in our countries and how we can promote uh, greater cooperation and, um, and sharing between both, part, both sides um, so that um, the voices and the recommendations of um, the students can be better uh, taken seriously um, and to be uh, implemented. And I think that um, that has been the greatest uh, benefit to uh, my work um, uh, and also my access to higher education. Thanks, Mr. Chan. That's, uh, I think you've raised some really important points there. One is about the, that sense of shared experiences. Uh, and I think for many people living with disability, there's a great sense of isolation, not just because of COVID, but because of, of life circumstances. And that, that sense of isolation can lead to an experience of, um, of aloneness, an experience where there's nobody like me who I can see. There's nobody um, that I can recognize or aspire to be because there are no role models. So I think that's a really important point and we will come back to that um, later in the conversation. But I wanted to pick up on something else you've said about the importance of influencing policy. Uh, and we've had a, a question from the audience here about what we can do, what ASEF can do, what um, members of the audience here today can do uh, and the panelists to actually influence policy to make sure that governments take seriously the needs of people living with disability in their community right across um, the world and, and what we can do to influence that policy. Uh, and perhaps I'll open that up to the panel. Are there any, any thoughts about how we can uh, actually do that, how we can influence policy? I'm happy to have a, a stab at that. Um, the first thing I would say is this question is very geographically and culturally specific because it de depends very much on the political system in the country you're talking about and also the cultural expectations around who is entitled to speak. So, for example, in Australia, there is um, a very strong focus on what we call the phrase, uh, nothing about us without us which is a way of saying that if you want to influence policy for students with disability, um, then we want to hear very much, see this, the, the, the people with disability involved in that conversation. So, so, so people like Mr Chan being the ones who are leading that discussion because they are seen as having an authority to speak from their lived experience. Uh, but then, like I said, it's also very specific to your political system. Do you, um, and you just need to know what works better. Uh, in Australia, there's, uh, again, uh, a lot of uh, success can happen around forming advocacy groups and highlighting particular issues. So, for example, the, the term in Australia used often is people with disability. But within that, there are very strong active groups around uh, people with autism, uh, people who are hard of hearing, deaf, um, people who have learning difficulties, specific learning disabilities, and they find that if they can come together as a group, they can find uh, supporters who are sympathetic to their issues, and they can also focus on one or two things that are really important to them. And as they do that, generally things tend to move quite well for a lot of other groups of students with disabilities. Yeah, and just to follow on from Tim's point as well, I think there's a certain responsibility that when you're in a position of power and government power and you, you, you want to, to use Tim's phrase, you know, you want to include um, people with um, additional needs in the discussion, you need to be mindful that um, traditional ways of consulting may not be appropriate. So, 
you know, um, written submissions to government, for example, may be very difficult with people with, 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 with certain uh, disabilities. And so, uh, in a way, you're discriminating straight away. So, if you are in a position where you are genuinely seeking input from um, these groups, then you need to modify how um, you get feedback, how you can be inclusive. And it comes back to Tim's point about universal design. You know, it's thinking, instead of thinking only about traditional ways of doing things, it's really widening that to consider, well, how can we do this differently to ensure everyone has the capacity and the accessibility to participate? Thanks, Professor O'Shea and, and Associate Professor Pittman. Uh, Mr. Chan, did you have any, any further comments on that one? Um, I think that uh, both um, uh, Mr. Pittman and uh, Professor O'Shea um, absolutely um, um, got that nailed down on um, the correct representation. Of, um, of the people that we actually work with. Um, I think that um, um, new research has shown the benefits of the consultation of uh, voices of the communities we work with, in this case, uh, people with disabilities. Um, I think that um, um, uh, individuals in the progressive um, push for uh, accessible accessibility and inclusion diversity have highlighted how in um, structurally um, um, many areas of, um, of disability, including um, uh, service uh, provision and policy making have um, been influenced by uh, prior research uh, done by people with, who may not have share, um, lived experience um, and who have their own conceptions on what it means to, have, uh, to live with a disability. Um, I think that um, a greater um, a consultation with um, experts with a lived experience of disability will power um, how we provide services, how we create policies, and how we work with um, disabled people and people with disabilities. Um, and so I totally agree with um, the opinions of Mr. Pittman and uh, Professor O'Shea. Thank you, Mr. Chan. And I think the panel has um, touched on some really important points here. Um, in particular, uh, uh, the concept of nothing about us without us, or as, as uh, James altered, nothing about us done without us. and culturally based. Um, so I can't stand here and, and, and recommend that you all undertake activism. I, um, I live in a country where that is, where that is possible. And in, in fact, I, I head uh, an activist organization called the Australian Tertiary Education Network on Disability. And so I can engage with government without fear of reprisal or without fear of, um, of harm. I know that for some of you, that's not the case. And um, so it's a very subtle process of, of um, building relationship with significant people of influence in the country and helping them to understand why this is an important need. Uh, and, and just over time, building those relationships. You know, Australia didn't get to where we are now uh, overnight. This journey in Australia started probably about 40 years ago with deinstitutionalization, where we took uh, people living with disability out of institutions and put them into the community. And then for the first time, they were visible. And, and that process actually led to a whole lot of cultural and legislative change. But that was 40 years of work to get to where we are now. So, it's a long, slow process, but it's built by building relationship with key people and 
fighting for change in whatever capacity, in whatever way is available to you. Um, I'd like to move back um, to, to the next question, which I think builds on, on this current conversation. So how important is stigma in relation to access and participation in higher education for a student with an additional need? Um, does stigma, and I think we've, we've, we, we know the answer to this one, does stigma vary between countries or by type of disability? And how important is it to see ro role models of successful people with additional needs? Um, perhaps I can pass this to Mr Chan and also Associate Professor Pittman and also um, Professor Sarah O'Shea to see um, what the panel thinks about this important question and how that may influence our capacity to advocate. Who would like to go first? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm happy to. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, and as you say, I think we know the answer to the second is stigma does vary between countries. It is very culturally specific. Um, the, it is very important to see role models um, because it normalises. And again, it's another aspect of universal design that is not specifically universal design, but is around universality. People with disability don't want to only see other people with disability in, in studying as higher education students. They want to see their lecturers, they want to see their professors also having um, similar experiences to them. So the more we can get the students to not only come in as students, but to go on and become role models is very important. In terms of um, the way I want to, the, the angle I want to take on the first part of this question is the critical role of disability support officers, um, that's what we call them generally in Australia, but the, the, this, the particular professional experts in universities whose role it is to facilitate and make sure that students with disability have their needs met. What we have found from experience is that when these structures are first put into place, there is in many cases a resistance to recognising their authority by the academic um, community and the academic community sometimes feel threatened, feel that uh, that it is their teaching and learning, it is their curriculum, that they see themselves as not being the experts and the, the final voice in how their teaching and learning is delivered to students. And what we found over time was it was very important to build up professional respect and recognition between the two groups. And this can often happen informally better than it can happen formally. We found that when universities implemented disability support officers and started telling their lecturers and their teachers, you must listen to these people, you must make the accommodations they ask, it can, it, it in many cases, became quite conflicting and quite a, a quite conflictive relationship. Um, and instead, when the universities took the time to make sure that the groups, the, the lecturers and the disability support officers could interact with each other and talk about their roles and talk about their expertise, each group would respect and recognise each other. And when that happened, um, then the, the lecturing staff and the academic staff were much more willing to follow the direction of the disability support officers. Uh, I think I've spoken enough. I'd love to hear from someone else now. I'll go next and or if James would like to go I'm more than happy to hand over to James. <laughs> um, on the matter of stigma, I mean, um, uh, I, as a, a person who identify with uh, as being amongst the youth um, age group, I, I go onto internet forums, I go into video game networks and I um, see the the, the language they, talk, uh, they use to uh, talk about um, the behaviours of people online and how they often um, equate um, certain bad behaviours with like um, having Asperger's or things like that. Um, 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 these are the kind of um, misconceptions that we deal with. These are the kind of um, values that um, young people um, not often visible to us if we do not spend time in this uh, place. 
um, these are the kind of values they have, and these are the people who are going to grow up to in, go into a workforce, having the same values about people with disabilities, and um, and perpetuating these structural issues of stigma. And um, I think that public education, uh, inside and outside of, of ed, uh, academics, has to be done uh, in order for this entire uh, machinery to really um, unite around inclusion and diversity in the world. Um, um, I think that um, subtly, um, stigma also affects um, uh, us in the in more con uh, conservative um, contexts, um, especially when the uh, legislation on anti-discrimination or uh, attitudes that are pro uh, inclusion and accessibility are not there. Um, in conservative societies, especially for certain subjects in universities. Um, uh, people with disabilities or uh, those who identify as, as uh, users of psych psychiatry still face issues accessing certain um, sensitive quote-unquote um, subjects. Um, they find it very difficult to, um, um, or just in, in fact impossible to um, access these form of subjects in um, courses, majors in university. Um, and there's little you can do about it. Um, I did uh, go to show that um, the misunderstanding about disability and mental health uh, and mental health, uh, coupled with the um, the power of the media, the negative, the uh, ill effects of uh, the power of the media, um, um, causing misunderstanding and um, perpetuating stigma, um, and uh, and therefore impacting universities as uh, course providers are, are unwilling to provide reasonable reasonable accommodation um, to these individuals, um, uh, rather than uh, uh, rather than acknowledging um, structural issues at play. Um, uh, therefore, sense. I I totally yeah. agree that stigma is a very difficult issue here. Yeah, um, thank you, James. That's really important, and I think we can all agree that stigma is a profoundly important issue in the inclusion of people living with disability in higher education. I'm conscious we have about uh, uh, a minute till we're bumped out of this session. So I just wanted to, um, to draw it to a close and wrap up and, and, and thank all of our panelists today. Uh, Professor Sarah O'Shea, Associate Professor Tim Pittman and uh, Mr. James Chan, you have brought a great deal of wisdom and insight to the conversation today. And uh, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of those who uh, have been attending today. I think if there's a message we leave um, the session with, it's about persistence. Um, that's what I'm hearing underneath all of this. It's about persistence and um, knowing that a person living with disability has a right to be included in all aspects of community life, including education, uh, whether that person be a boy or a girl um, or a transgender, we all have a right to access education and, and the conversations need to start in the community visibility of everyone um, in all kinds of roles living with disability and it's a long-term game.